Hello, hello, hello. My name is Jill Osborne. I am the president and founder of the Interstitial Cystitis Network. It is Sunday, January 6th, and it is time to do an IC support group meeting. I hope that uh, my goal with these meetings is to give you so much information. I want you so strong, so informed, so educated, so powerful, so powerful that you can take control of your medical care. I don't want anybody telling you that there is no hope for IC, that there are no treatments for IC. Hi, Barbara. Nice to see you. This is about being strong, informed, and powerful in 2018. Now, we have a really bad storm going on right now, and the lighting is really weird, and because it's really gray and stormy out there, and if I disappear suddenly, that means that our power has gone out. I'm kind of waiting for our power to go out. So, let's, our first scheduled support group meeting for 2019. Very, very exciting. I'm always happy to do this. Uh, let's wait a few minutes, let people come on in. And um, I'm going to do this meeting uh, in three stages. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to do a little bit of educational information. The second thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to ask you a question. Because, you know, whenever we do support group meetings, there are always multiple people in the room. We've got newly diagnosed patients who are here for hope and encouragement and information. Then we've got our grizzled veteran IC patients, patients who have had IC for a long time, who might be struggling, who need support and they need encouragement. So uh, in running my in-person meetings, I always had a question because I want to mine you for information. You've got wisdom out there. You've got knowledge out there that I know are, is going to help other patients. So uh, step two of this meeting is going to be asking you an important question. And then step three of this meeting is going to be taking your questions. And of course, at some point in time during this meeting, we're also going to do a giveaway. So... Let's just wait a couple of minutes, let some people come in. Hello, YouTube. It's very, very nice to see you. Now, on YouTube, we had some stalkers or some, you know, goofy people uh, on Wednesday. Hel Lisa, Lisa, my dear, I am finally ready to do uh, coaching again. You know, I had a really bad cold for two weeks, so I was not able to do coaching, but I'm going to call you this week so we can do your coaching already. Um, okay, uh, question... Hold on. I have to make notes here. Best. Three Q and A. And four freebies. Now I want to introduce myself. Um, for those of you who haven't been to a support group meeting before, my name is Jill Osborne. I am the president and founder of the Interstitial Cystitis Network. This is our 25th anniversary. Holy smokes, as a the largest IC support group in the world, we're also the largest IC support group, obviously, in the United States. Um, uh, I started out um, as, uh, well, let's see, let me give you a quick rundown. So I got, I've got three college degrees. I've got a degree in chemistry. I've got a degree in drug development, biochemistry, pharmacology. That was from University of California. I didn't like the work in uh, pharmacology. I didn't like the lab work. I didn't like the animal research. I love animals. I couldn't do it. Uh, and so I moved back and went instead into psychology. I have a master's degree in psychology. I was going on for my PhD in psychology when IC hit. And ironically, the IC network is, it was in fact my doctoral dissertation proposal. My goal was to bring support online to patients who were suffering because back then in 1993, 1994, we had in-person meetings. I was originally a support group leader for the ICA, but I was really, I was really concerned about the patients who I knew were suffering, but who could not come to meetings. You know, I would do all this preparation for our big meetings here in Northern California. I had 300 people in my group. And yet when we actually had the meeting, you know, only like 25 people came unless we had a really big guest speaker and we'd maybe have 70 people. And um, when I call these patients on the phone, it's like, oh, we have the best meeting. Why didn't you come to our meeting? And their answer was because it hurt. It hurt. It hurts to get in the car when you have IC. It hurts to drive when you have IC. I know this because I would drive to Petaluma Valley Hospital where we had our meetings crying because I hurt me. 
Um, so, oh, and you know what? I want to make sure. Let me get, I want to make sure this microphone is good. I hope, I hope you all can hear me well. Yeah. All right. Good. Okay. So, so like, seriously, I would drive. I mean, I ran my support group for, for 15 years in person here in California. I would drive to meetings crying because sitting in a car hurts so much. So back in 1994, I was like, well, how can I bring support to patients who are at home? What can I do to help them? And, you know, back then, back in the dark ages, what did we have? We had America Online and CompuServe. And I started the first online support groups on America Online. A urology, some of the first urology support groups. I worked with paraplegics, quadriplegics, IC patients, chronic prostatitis patients, cancer patients, UTI patients, radiation cyst patients, cystitis patients. And I gathered all this data um, that showed that patients, on, patients would come online in the middle of the night when you needed it the most. And I was really excited because my theory worked. And then I brought my information to the ICA, the Interstitial Cystitis Association in 1994, and offered to build them the first website and online support system for IC. Well, they didn't think it was a good idea. I get, was given a lecture on knowing my place in the IC movement that no one would ever use the internet for support and that it was a stupid idea. And uh, I begged to differ and said, well, you know what? If you don't want to do it, that's fine. I'm going to do it myself. And that is exactly how the IC network started. So today, 25 years later, we are, we are still number one on the web. We uh, were rated number one by Harvard Medical School uh, in, their, in a peer-reviewed study that, that evaluated uh, websites for accuracy, reliability, credibility. We are rated number one by the University of London over in England in a, in a similar research study. So I know that we offer something good. Now, we did support group meetings online for years in our chat room, um, but then video started and then social networking came and then Facebook came and people went to Facebook and, you know, it was a difficult time because we were the center of IC for many, many years and then Facebook came and now we have support groups on Facebook. But you know what? I say the more voices, the better. The more groups, the better. I know that my approach might, might work for some people and not for other people. And there might be groups on Facebook that you love or groups somewhere else that you love. And some of you may like the IC network. So anyway, uh, I started doing these live support group meetings last summer because I was really struggling with Facebook. I felt that there was a lot of bad information on Facebook and I, I shut down our website for a while, our page on Facebook. <sighs> and then it just kind of dawned on me, Jill, come on, you're a support group leader. Not only are you a support group leader, you're the oldest and longest serving support group leader. So be a support group leader. So I decided to start doing online support group meetings on America Online and on YouTube. So that's on Facebook and YouTube. So that's what we're doing right now. We are simulcasting live on Facebook and YouTube. Um, and, you know, still learning the technology and all sorts of stuff, video quality, because I'm sim simulcasting on two platforms isn't the best. Uh, I'm going to work on that. I'm probably going to start streaming instead on Twitch. So hopefully those of some of you know what Twitch TV is, I'm there every day watching other stuff. So you're going to find that. Alrighty. So uh, the IC network, we are a health education company specializing in, specializing in IC, bladder pain, prostate pain, pelvic floor dysfunction, chronic pelvic pain. Um, I'm not a doctor. I cannot give you medical advice. My goal is to educate you, empower you, give you the sources that you need so that you can go to the doctor and kick some butt. Because I don't want any more patients told that it's all in their head. And it stuns me that in 2019, we still have patients who are told that. And that is true because I've already worked with patients this year who have been told that. So working together, we're going to make a difference. Working together, we're going to raise awareness on IC. And, and uh, there you go. That's my pitch. I hope you like it. Uh, but anyway... So, um, let me get to the educational part of this meeting. Um, hold on a sec. I got to pull up this page here for a moment. So, one of the things, you know, since we've been doing online support on the web for 25 years now, um, uh, and we have 50,000 members of our support forum, if you're interested in going over to the IC network, 
you can go check it out. It's free, obviously. Let me hold up my slide. Here it is. So if you've never been to our website, come on over to our website, ic-network.com. Now listen, in 25 years, we've, we've encountered a lot of scams, a lot of scams. Man, we had people saying you could cure your IC with magnets. We had people who said you could cure your IC by drinking the juice of a lemon one day. We had people who said that you could cure IC if you bought their book for $29 on, uh, on the web. And if you bought that book, it talks about salt intake. Uh, you name it, we've heard it. And one of my jobs as a support group leader is to give you a reality check here. Because seriously, I don't want you to waste your money anymore. You know, and I don't want you to be a sucker to somebody who says, hey, if you sign up my, for my program for a thousand bucks, I can help you cure your IC. There's a reason why we can't say that. And it's called subtypes. It's called subtypes. Not every patient is the same. There's tremendous diversity in the IC patient population. So we've got some patients with bleeding bladders who've got Hunter's lesions, Hunter's ulcers. We've got other patients with completely normal bladders, both diagnosed with IC, yet clearly they're very different. We've got some patients with terrible pain, others with no pain. We've got some patients who have a lot of related conditions to IC, others with no related to conditions with IC, all diagnosed with IC, yet clearly they're not the same, right? And if you look at how patients' symptoms began and, and what they think triggered their symptoms, that's where you really see the diversity, okay? Because for many patients, IC begins after an accident, a fall, falling on your tailbone having a baby, something that traumatizes the pelvic floor. For other people, IC begins after chemotherapy. For some people, IC begins after maybe a bladder infection. For others, IC begins when they become menopausal. Clearly, clearly, there's vast diversity in the IC patient population. And this is why a one treatment fits all approach does not work. How do we know that? Because Elmeron didn't work for most people. It didn't work for me. Didn't work for most people, right? So now we understand why. Because not everybody's the same. Not everybody is the same. So for the last five to 10 years, what researchers have been doing is something called subtyping. We're trying to understand your unique variation of IC so that we can focus the right treatments for you. If, for example, your symptoms are the result of an injury, we're going to be doing probably muscle work. If your symptoms began after menopause, we're going to be focusing maybe on trying to restore some estrogen. If your symptoms began after chemotherapy, we're going to be calming and soothing. Tremendous diversity, okay? So anybody online who says, I can help you cure your IC, if you pay me money, and follow my program, whether it's an anti-inflammatory diet or whether it's reducing salt or taking colostrum or whatever, they are wrong. They are wrong. Now they may be able to help a small subtype of IC and that's possible. Do I want you to follow an anti-inflammatory diet? Sure, Google it, look at it, absolutely. Reduce sugar, absolutely. Go organic, absolutely. I've got no support with it. I have no problem with that at all. But what I don't want you to do is assume that that person knows how to cure your unique session, sec uh, type of IC, because we don't know what your subtype is. So in Europe, there are 16 variations, 16 subtypes of IC that are based on pathology results and what your bladder looks like. And that was created by the Essex Society. In Canada, they use the U-point subtyping system. Uh, and over on our website, I have a whole section on subtypes, so you can read about that. So in Canada, a diagnosis is based on six potential subtypes. In the United States, we have not agreed on a subtype, subtyping system. But I use the subtyping system that was created by Dr. Christopher Payne, at, uh, who ran the IC research program at Stanford University. Okay? 
And he proposed, and I've talked about this in many of our online chats here, he proposed five fundamental core subtypes for IC. Okay. And so I want to read to you a patient story that was just submitted on our website um, so that you can put into context why your experience is going to be different from somebody else's and why anybody online who says they can fix you with a bladder diet or whatever is wrong, okay? Because it all begins with your subtype first. So let me just take a minute and read this patient's story to you. Um, I've been meaning, and I'm not going to give their name, obviously. Okay. I've been meaning to write my story for a while now, but due to a busy life, I put it on hold. When my pain was really bad, I would come onto the IC Network Forum and read the success stories and feel better and have some sense of hope for the future. But here's my story. My pain started November, November 16 out of nowhere. The pain was bad. I mean bad. My whole pelvis felt like it was on fire and nothing helped. I tried Elmeron, which made it burn even more. Corn silk, marshmallow roots, Cisto Protect, aloe vera, countless other supplements that did nothing. As you can imagine, the amount of money I spent was insane. The only thing that maybe minutely helped was the corn silk, maybe. But I tried countless diets such as vegetarian, vegan, elimination, and the low histamine diet. None of them helped. If anything, I became low on nutrients as I barely ate and drowned myself in water. I even, brought, I even bought expensive Evian bottled water thinking my water was too acidic. My weight dropped to a low 103 pounds. I cried every day sitting in a hot bath praying that the pain would end. I took medical leave from work for three months because I couldn't function anymore. Now let's get to an actual diagnosis because this is an important part. I went to a urologist who said right off the bat that I had IC. He did a series of six bladder washes that did absolutely nothing. He then did a hydrodistension which showed a perfectly healthy bladder lining. No petechiae, no redness, nothing. He said that it's common practice nowadays to diagnose IC based upon symptoms but I did not accept this idea. How can I have IC with no visible irritation? It was time to move on and figure out what the problem was. It is now March 2017, so I've been in horrible pain for almost six months. I got tested for food allergies, thinking I was eating something that didn't agree with my bladder. I got, let's see, I got the 50 panel skin test done and everything was normal. I also requested a 24 hour urine histamine level, which was normal. I got tested for Lyme disease because I did some research that bacteria can chill in your bladder wall. I live in Rhode Island and ticks are everywhere. Well, that came back negative. I got tested for urea plasma and all those other weird bacteria that can cause symptoms. All came back negative. I even went on a broad spectrum uh, antibiotic for a month just in case something was lurking in there that wasn't showing on tests. That didn't help. My urine was always perfectly normal except for a trace amount of blood. I kept coming up empty handed, which made me more depressed. I was in such a bad place. It's now May 17 and the pain is getting better, more tolerable, but still uncomfortable. I started researching bladder nerve issues, specifically pudendal neuralgia. All of my symptoms fit this diagnosis. I saw a specialist in New Hampshire, one of only five doctors in the country who will diagnose us, and he said this is more, like, more than likely what I had. I had a pelvic MRI done, which showed that my sacrum was in terrible alignment. It was pushed outward, making my lower back curvy. It was always like this, and I never thought anything of it. But he said the nerves supplying my pelvis were stretched because of an alignment issue. Unfortunately, there's no cure, only treatment. I went on Cymbalta for nerve pain, which helped 40% of the pain. Then it dawned on me to go see a chiropractor. He did x-rays and was honestly shocked at how bad my sacrum was pushed outward. He did a, a series of 22 adjustments. That's how bad over a period of two months. He told me that it will take four to six months for aggravated nerves to settle down after the, low, after the adjustments. And lo and behold, and said, by September 17th, my pain had improved another 
So if you can do the math, I'm about 60 to 70% better now. My pain never completely went away, but it's much more tolerable and I can live a normal life. I still get flare-ups and bad days, but it's nothing like it was. Notice I wrote this in success stories, not, let's see, hold on. There's a lot of lines here, not remission, but my life is so much better now. I'm not even on Cymbalta anymore and my pain levels have remained the same. It did not get worse by going off of it. I even got pregnant in January 2018 and had a beautiful baby boy in October of 18. I still go back to the chiropractor once every few weeks to keep my back in check. If you told me a year ago that my life would be this different, I would have laughed in your face. The moral of this long story is to investigate more and get tested for everything possible. Don't let a doctor give you a diagnosis based off nothing. There are so many other conditions other than IC that can cause a painful bladder. If your bladder looks normal, consider the nerve route. Consider your spine. A urologist and gynecologist will more likely than not mention this to you. I used to read these stories praying that I would be able to write one of my own someday. I promise that if I got better, I would write one, hoping that I can help someone. Your pain will get better too. Just give it time. It took me almost a year to get to a tolerable level, but if I could come out of this, so can you. Right? Okay. So think about it. So here you've got a patient with a completely normal bladder, right? A completely normal bladder, but she's got bladder symptoms. Now she would come online and watch that video of somebody saying you can cure your IC with an anti-inflammatory diet. She would not be better because it's not, it wasn't about inflammation in her case. In her case, it was a spinal misalignment, what we call, or uh, or, or basically a, a spinal misalignment or compressed nerve. A better way to think about it is pressed nerve. And hello, my friends, that is IC subtype four. So using the Chris Payne subtyping system, we have five subtypes. I see subtype one, Hunter's lesions. So you are the ones who've got the big bloody wounds in your bladder. You're the ones who can barely eat. You're probably down to five or six foods. Think about this patient. She, she eliminated almost everything, lost a massive amount of weight thinking it was her bladder and it was never her bladder. But a patient with Hunter's lesions, you got big bloody wounds in your bladder. Yeah, you're gonna be diet tolerant, intolerant. And, it, Hunter's lesions do not respond to typical medication. They're not going to respond to Elmeron. They're not going to respond to a bladder installation. What they are going to respond to is lesion-specific therapy, like cauterization, fulguration, a, a triamcinolone steroid injection, or, or we actually have the first treatment in history that is healed, healed, hello, healed, the worst form of IC. Uh, it's called Lyris. You know, so these patients were long thought to be have to live a, a, a life of terrible pain. And yet we now have a therapy which has healed them. It's currently in clinical trials. But if you've got Hunter's lesions, carry hope in your heart. But of course, patients with Hunter's lesions. Yeah, man, follow the anti-inflammatory diet. Why the hell not? Follow the diet. You'd be a fool to be drinking coffee and soda if you got a big bloody wound in your bladder. Right. Whereas the patient with pudendal nerve entrapment, she can drink coffee. She'd be fine. Okay. I see subtype two, bladder wall driven. So these are the patients who have direct bladder wall issue or trauma or injury. So we know your bladder is driving your symptoms if you have pain as your bladder fills with urine that is relieved by urination. So the fuller you get, the worse you feel, and as soon as you pee, you feel better. And I can show you exactly why that happens. And again, sorry guys, there's just the storm and the lighting, all that sort of stuff. So look, here is a typical picture of uh, IC subtype two bladder wall driven. So imagine your urine getting fuller and fuller and fuller and fuller with urine. Now remember, urine contains body waste, contains ammonia and urea and all sorts of irritating stuff, right? So 
as your bladder gets fuller, urine gets into the wound and it hurts. It irritates it. So fuller, fuller, worse, worse. And then as soon as you pee, urine is no longer on the wound and you feel better. You feel better. All right. So in this subtype, we've got sub subtypes. Okay. So we've got different variants in this subtype. We, we're probably going to see uh, chemo induced cystitis, a chemical irritation. Uh, we're going to see, and, and also in that category are people who have drunk diet soda for years and stuff like that. I mean, seriously, remember folks, your bladder was designed for life 5, 10, 15, 20, 100,000 years ago. They didn't have coffee 100,000 years ago. If you're drinking a lot of coffee and soda, you're introducing a lot of acid to a bladder that was not designed to tolerate that high level of acid. Okay, so we're going to see chemical induced cystitis. We're going to see chemotherapy induced cystitis. We're going to see ketamine induced cystitis. If you're a partier and you've gone to a rave and you've taken ketamine, ketamine is pretty much a solvent. It destroys the bladder. You do ketamine for three to six months, your, your bladder is going to look a hell of a lot worse than this. And ketamine also damages kidneys, damages other things too. Um, we're also going to see in this subtype menopause. Now here is a three-dimensional picture of the bladder wall. Okay. Let's see. Hold on. Got to get it right. Okay. So there's three layers. On the outside of your bladder is a layer of mucus. Because your bladder is like your mouth. It is a hollow organ covered with mucus. It is wet inside. And that wetness is critically important for the health of the bladder because that wetness will protect, it acts as a barrier. It protects your bladder from any irritants, right? So the first thing you got on the, in, on the innermost side of your bladder is a layer of mucus. Then you've got four to five layers of umbrella cells. These are the largest single cells in the human body. They're really fascinating cells. And then underneath that, we've got blood vessels and nerves. Unfortunately, this mucosal barrier, this wetness is estrogen dependent. So when you're young and you got lots of estrogen, you got lots of mucus. But when you're older, you have less estrogen, you have less mucus. Thus, unfortunately, what happens is that the irritants in urine can now reach these cells and do some fairly dastardly things in terms of provoking inflammation, histamines, all sorts of other stuff. That is called the genitourinary syndrome of menopause. And it usually begins in the urethra. So if, if you are a woman who is who you're either menopausal or you've lost your ovaries or you're surgically induced menopause and your urethra is screaming, odds are it could be estrogen atrophy. OK, also in this subtype, we see chronic infection. There is a small but real population of patients who have chronic infection. And the reality today is that E. coli and other bacteria have developed tremendous uh, resistance to antibiotics. And, you know, I always like to say that, that our gener my generation is the first fully antibiotic generation. We were exposed to antibiotics when our mothers were pregnant with us. And as a result, any bacteria living in our body already had the um, external pressure of adapting or defeating antibiotics. Our biome, our, our urinary biome has been massively changed because of that antibiotic exposure. And what we can, we continue to see with greater and greater urgency are more and more challenging E. coli and other infections in the bladder that are becoming harder to treat. So if you're one of those patients where you keep getting recurring infection, testing positive over and over and over, and it keeps coming back over and over and over, you may have one of these very, very resistant bladder infections. And that's kind of a whole nother story um, that I've talked about in other um, meetings. But um, for these patients, it's really uh, important to think about having a next generation urine test done. Because what we know now is typical urine testing, uh, which is a urine culture, 
will only identify 1% of the, of the potential of good and bad bacteria as well as fungi that live have the potential of living in the bladder wall. So a lot of the new IC research as well as infectious disease specialists as well as urologists have now turned to next generation DNA testing to really study what's living in your bladder. It, this test will give you all the good bacteria because hello, urine is not sterile. You are supposed to have good bacteria in your bladder. So this will tell you the good bacteria. This will tell you any pathogenic bad bacteria. But even more importantly, this will tell you if you have any fungus growing in your bacteria because it was our own MAP research network, the National Institutes of Health Multidisciplinary Approach to the Study of Pelvic Pain, which is our big leading IC and chronic prostatitis research arm at the federal government. Um, they're the ones who discovered that many patients in flares actually have candida infections, candida in your urine. And guess what? A typical urine test will not, does not assess for fungus, but the next generation test will. So I see subtype two bladder wall driven, and we kind of have to kind of, you know, we have to kind of finesse that a little bit, try to understand which one you might be in. And then you're going to be doing bladder specific calming and soothing therapies. And of course, in this subtype, because your bladder is fried, you're going to be doing diet, right? I see subtype three is pelvic floor driven. So these are the patients whose symptoms began after a muscle trauma. And it could have been an old muscle trauma. Um, I think about um, a paratrooper that I worked with who um, had terrible frequency urgency pain, and yet he wasn't diet sensitive at all. Obviously, in his case, his diet, his bladder actually was probably pretty good. Um, the challenge in his case, when we started probing his history, is that he was an Army career paratrooper. Uh, he was a ranger. And he did 30 or 40 parachute drops, of which many times he fell and hurt his pelvis. And that's about the time that he started experiencing bladder symptoms. Or the young man that I worked with who uh, everybody, or actually his mother that I worked with, who um, uh, was told that his quote, I see was all in his head. And yet when we went back in time, his symptoms started exactly after a ski accident because he had a muscle trauma. So it turns out that your pelvic floor muscles, which go from left to right, from front to back, and from low to high, which are normally, they, they're the only muscle group that influence major bodily functions because in your pelvic floor, you've got a urethra going through, you've got a vagina coming up if you're a woman, and you've got a rectum going through. So your pelvic floor has direct and over influence over how your bladder and how your other organs function. If your muscles are tight, it restricts blood flow to the bladder. It restricts blood flow to other organs. It starts to impinge nerves. And guess what? It's hard to pee. It's hard to poop. It's hard to have a bowel movement. Hard to have sex when your muscles are locked down like that. Um, so for this group, and this is why, why now every major IC clinic in the country should be doing pelvic floor assessments at the very first appointment. For this group, we're not going to throw basic bladder therapies hit you, we're going to do physical therapy because our therapeutic priority with this patient is to get these muscles from tight to relax. We want to restore blood flow. So their treatment priority is really going to be focused on muscles, calming muscles. Um, I see subtype four, pudendal neuralgia. It's, going to, it's a nerve injury. And usually it's a nerve injury because a nerve is being compressed in some way. And as that patient story I just read to you shows, in her case, it was a skeletal abnormality that was probably leading to a muscle abnormality, which was pressing nerves. So for pudendal neuralgia, we're going to be calming and soothing nerves. Uh, and, re and at the same time, um, uh, working on muscles and, and avoiding those things which uh, cause a nerve entrapment in the first place. Somebody with pudendal nerve entrapment, their symptoms are very positional. You're fine when you sit, you stand, but when you sit down, it hurts. Or when you bend over, it hurts. Alrighty. 
The last subtype is IC subtype 5 central sensitization. So these are the patients who have systemic body-wide symptoms. This is my subtype. We have very sensitive skin. We are drug sensitive. We can't take a normal dose of medication. We got to take pediatric doses, half doses. We are food sensitive. There are some foods that just don't work with us because hello, not only do we have a sensitive bladder, we've got a sensitive bowel, we got a sensitive vulva, we got a sensitive rectum, we've got a sensitive stomach. We are sensitive. We're, and in many cases, this is inherited. This is just inherited. Um, I'm from uh, my family. I'm 95% Scandinavian. My family comes from the Arctic Circle. Go back 5,000 years ago. What were my ancestors eating? The world's blandest diet. They were eating deer. They were eating seals. They were eating whale. They were eating fish. They were eating, uh, 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 well, did I, I, I said deer already. They might have been eating greens. They might have been eating salt. And they might have been eating berries or apples. That's it. There was no coffee to be had. There was no acid to be had. The only acid that my ancestors were exposed to were the acid in unripe fruit. So evolutionary from an evolutionary standpoint, is my body has my body had the opportunity to adapt to high levels of acid? No, no. So I think sensitization is an evolutionary priority. I think for some of us, when you're, you, you have a more sensitive nervous system, you have a wicked sense of smell, maybe because that helped us find food 5,000 years ago or smell bad food 5,000 years ago. So with this subtype, you know, number one, it's, it, it's, not all, it, it, it's not in your head in any way, shape or form. In many cases, it's just the act of genetics. Sometimes it happens after some sort of major traumatic injury. And what it means is that your nerve action potential is lower. So you take a, a normal person and you put 500 cc's of, of water in their bladder, they can walk around for hours. You put 500 cc's of urine in my bladder with my sensitive nervous system, man, I got to pee in 10 minutes or five minutes. My bladder is healthy. You look at my bladder, it is a completely normal bladder. I have pictures of it because I had a hydrodistension last year. Um, but my nervous system is different. My nervous system has lower thresholds. So when you've got central sensitization, number one, we got to respect the sensitization. You don't fight it. You can't fight genetics. It is what it is. Um, and we tend to live a more quieter life. We tend to eliminate chemicals from our lives. Very important that we address anxiety, all sorts of stuff like that. Anyway, I'm more than happy to talk about that later. But getting back to my core concept here, uh, and that is anybody online who says that they can cure you if you pay them is wrong because it's all about your subtype. I don't want you to pay $500, $1,000, $2,000 to somebody who's going to say, follow my diet and you're going to get better because guess what? You might be that patient with pudendal neuralgia and it's all a, a bony muscle abnormality. So it begins first with subtyping. On our website at the IC Network, I have a video that talks in depth about the IC subtypes. And I encourage you to come watch that video because this is the future of IC care, my friends. This is the future, 2019 and beyond. There are a lot of doctors right now trying to create their own subtyping system. It's very in interesting. Some want to create a subtype based on pathology results of bladder biopsies like Europe did. You know, so we're going to have more subtyping uh, proposed and that's fine. That's fine. But at least it's a start. And now we know why a one treatment fits all approach does not work. Now we know why that Hunter's lesion patient does not respond to Elmeron. Now we know why that pelvic floor patient does not respond to Elmeron. But we also know why the bladder wall patient might be helped with a bladder coating because they have a problem with their bladder wall. So a menopausal patient uh, might do well with a bladder coating, maybe not Elmeron, but with that. Alrighty, so that is my little educational tidbit. <laughs> um, um, and I just, you know, I just, I was cruising the internet before Christmas or during Christmas when I had a really bad cold and I, I saw people starting to do that again, to promise cures that they could cure you, 100% positive they could cure you. And, and that offends me greatly.
Nancy on Facebook. Now, guys, be feel free to ask questions. Um, you know, again, we're simulcasting on Facebook and on YouTube. Um, Nancy um, on Facebook says, "Can you exp can you talk about anxiety in the bladder?" Uh, absolutely. And in fact, I have a video that talks about it also on our website. Now, number one, if you're in pain, you're anxious. I mean, seriously, if you've, if you've got something weird going on that you know is wrong and you want help and it hurts, you are going to become anxious about it. That is normal. Pain provokes anxiety. And anxiety is um, extremely common in the patient population. However, in this subtype, anxiety is pervasive. It's pervasive. I have anxiety disorder. I became anxious as a child. And um, it was because I had, we had in our neighborhood, uh, somebody who raped and murdered my neighbor and I had to grow up, uh, in this environment before, um, justice was brought. So we had a very evil person in my neighborhood and it got to the point where it was, it was hard to leave the house because you never knew where he was. Um, and so I really developed pretty wicked anxiety as a kid. Um, and it was pretty hard to kick. Um, I can remember being in grad school and hello, I had a master's degree in psychology and was going on for a PhD in psychology. And I was still struggling with anxiety. I was struggling because I had also, unfortunately, was one of his victims and I was attacked by him. And so I carried a lot of deep anxiety and fear because of that. Um, but, but we now have a new understanding of why anxiety may be more more common in patients with central sensitization. So if you are sensitive, so we know you are skin sensitive, we know you are smell sensitive, we know you are food sensitive, we know you are chemically sensitive. Anxiety is driven by adrenaline. And we have one doctor out here in California who wrote, who, who created this fabulous anxiety management class that I took. He was a surgeon with anxiety. And um, he focused more on the devastating effects of adrenaline for people who are sensitive. Because every time you have a negative thought or, or you're frightened, the odds are you also have a really high startle reflex, really or low startle reflex is really easy for you to get startled. Every time you have a negative thought or you get startled, you get a jolt of adrenaline. And if you have anxiety disorder, you have a hell of a lot of negative thoughts. We just, we're, we're, we can catastrophize constantly throughout the day. Every single time you have a negative thought, you get a shot of adrenaline, bam, 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 bam. And guess what? We are wickedly sensitive to adrenaline. So it's that high levels of adrenaline in the bloodstream that tend to drive the rapid heart rate, the nausea, the wanting to run, the wanting to flee, um, and all that sort of stuff. So his approach to anxiety management was to approach adrenaline levels. If you learn to control the adrenaline, your anxiety goes way, way down. And I took his class and it was miraculous. I have not had an anxiety class since I took his class. It was a, I considered absolutely amazing. So what he said is the secret to anxiety management is to control adrenaline. But right now you got a hell of a lot of adrenaline going through your bloodstream because you, you've got a lot of pain and it's scaring you. So every time you have a negative thought, the first thing he has you do is visualize a stop sign. Just stop your brain for a moment. Just like stop. Then take a nice, slow, deep breath in, out. That single breath, that single intake of adrenaline 
turns off, I mean, of oxygen, turns off the adrenaline from that negative thought. So step one, stop sign. Step two, deep breath. Step three, minimize the thought. Just remind yourself, oh my God, Jill, you are not God. You cannot predict the future. Get over yourself, right? That's what I say to myself uh, or something like that. Okay, so they taught us this three-step system. They sent us home. And they said so they warned us. They said you're going to be doing this hundreds of times in the next two or three days because you have no idea how negative your thoughts are because your adrenaline has basically uh, taken control of your of your brain chemistry. And they're true. Like the first day, I did it maybe two hundred times. Then the second day, I did it maybe a hundred times. Then the third day, God, it's hot. Sorry. Uh, the third day, I did it maybe 50 times. By the end of the week, I was doing it once a day. I have not had a panic attack since I have taken that class because that is what I do, my friends. Stop sign, deep breath, minimize the thought. Two emergency surgeries for uterine cancer. On the way to the hospital, no panic attack because that's what I was doing. So if you struggle with anxiety, Remember, God didn't give you the skills to deal with anxiety when you were born. You got to go learn them. Got to go learn them. And taking this anxiety management class changed my life. I would encourage you to take a class too. All righty. Okay. So the next thing that I want to do in this meeting is I want to mine your knowledge of IC because you have wisdom. You might not feel it, but you have wisdom to share. And there are newbies in this room right now or who will be watching this in the days, months, years to come who can learn from you. So for the next couple of minutes, I want you to share your best flare management tip. What do you do? that helps you with your flares. Let's just take a couple minutes and I, if you can, and then we'll come back to your questions. Don't worry about that. Derek, I, I, I will, I will uh, come back to your Elmeron I question. Um, and the answer is yes, there is more validation. If I miss your question, please don't take it personally. Just ask it again because the questions feed through all the time. So what is your best flare management tip? If you could say anything to another patient, what would it be? Kim says you should instruct on how to be careful not to contaminate when wiping after urination. E. coli is from the bowel. Kim, actually, we're now learning that E. coli is actually coming from food. You know, there's kind of this old perception that women, uh, mostly women, not men, mostly women with recurring infections have bad hygiene practices. Uh, well, we now know that uh, E. coli comes can come from uh, protein sources and from vegetable sources. It can, from, it can come from pork. It can come from chicken. It can come from beef. Chris asks, is there a way to get notified of these talks? Um, yeah, all you need to do is just uh, like our, our friend, our Facebook page. Uh, or are you subscribed to our YouTube channel? We do them twice a month, uh, the first and third Sunday of the month, 1230 Pacific time. Um, and then I also do drop in meetings and they're over on our website. We have a schedule of meetings over on our website. What is your best flare management tip? That's what I want to know. Ice, ice baby. Cold pack or heat packs? Absolutely. Cold pack works for, for you know, so interesting. Some patients love heat and some patients love cold. I love heat. My body craves heat. Give me heat and I'm happy camper. I do not like cold. Cold seems to work well more for people with neuroinflammation. Heat seems to work more, better for people with uh, muscle tension. 
lots of water, ice pack, rest, essential oils, desert harvest aloe, drink water. Yeah, yeah. good, good, good. All right, guys. I'm going to come back after the fact and we're going to, uh, I'm going to write all these down. Um, this is exactly how I ran my support group meetings. We had a big whiteboard and we just wrote everybody. When everybody did their intro and introduced themselves, I, 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 I would, I, we didn't do their history because that would take forever. I would have them say their name and then they would answer a question about IC and then we would share that knowledge. All right. So let's go back to your questions here. Um, Carol says, I've been on Elmeron for years and then had a cystoscopy in my bladder looked fine. Is it because of the Elmeron? There are no pictures on my bladder when I started Elmeron. Well, you know, Carol, that's such an important point because we don't really know if your bladder was fine in the first place, right? That you really might, you might've been in one of those other categories. Somebody asked Dr. Parsons, will I have to take Elmeron for the rest of my life? And he said, no, no, you don't. But we just need to know if it's helping you. So how do we know if it's helping you? Just reduce your dose. If you're taking four a day, take three a day for a week. See if your symptoms change. If your symptoms change and get worse, then the Elmeron's helping you. If your symptoms don't change, go to two a day. Go to one a day and see if that makes a difference. Um, uh, because, again, now we know why Elmeron is... You know, Elmeron is not the only act in town anymore. And as somebody was saying earlier, we if you if you aren't aware of it, we now have research from the Emory Eye Center, which has linked Elmeron to serious macular eye macular retinal disease, which is a stunner. If you go back to our September support group meetings online, you I, I, I oh my God, you know, I mean I was I was uh, trying to create new stories for the IC network and was over on the National Library of Medicine when I saw this little tiny reference to this little tiny letter to the editor in the Journal of Urology. And, and I just kind of, it was interesting. And so I went over to the Journal of Urology. I have a doctor who lets me use his account because it costs like a thousand dollars a year to get. And I read it and it was stunning. It was a, it was a letter from the doctors at the Emory Eye Institute who wanted to share that they felt that they had found a new eye disease that they had associated with a long-term use of Elmeron. And in fact, I have it right here. Let's see here. Journal of Urology. And it was a letter in response to an article on completely other topic called BRUDAC, which was a consensus meeting to create new diagnostic criteria for IC clinical trials, right? And so here you've got these, these doctors down in Atlanta who have no way of communicating to the IC world that they think they have found a serious problem. So they chose a very interesting way. They chose a letter to the editor in the Journal of Urology, and I can read it to you because it's short. Um, as mentioned by the authors, only two FDA um, approved therapies for IC currently exist, oral pentose and polysulfate and intravescal DMSO. We wish to alert readers to a concerning new observation of vision threatening retinal changes associated with a long-term exposure of pentose and polysulfate we recently reported our findings of retinal pigmentary changes in six patients undergoing long-term therapy, with, uh, therapy with, with pentosin. They described difficulty reading, trouble adjusting to dim lighting, and there were several other symptoms. Each patient had received a standard dosage of Elmeron ranging from two to 400 milligrams daily for a median duration of 15 years. Examination findings uh, in patients with this condition are suggestive of injury to the retina and the underlying retinal pigment epithelium. And in this, uh, in this um, letter, they encourage doctors prescribing Elmeron to ask patients if they are experiencing any eye disorders and if they are any eye symptoms to encourage them to go get an eye exam, right? So that was a bomb. Like I read this and was going, oh my God, this is like the worst news I have ever, ever, ever had to share in the IC community. And I've shared a lot of bad news in the IC community. 
Then what was so interesting is whenever somebody writes a letter to the editor of the General Urology, the doctors of the original article get a reply. And so the doctors of the original article were Rob Moldwin and Curtis Nickel. And you should know Rob Moldwin. He was the author of the Interstitial Cystitis Survival Guide. And he's one of the top IC doctors in the United States. Curtis Nickel is the top IC doctor in Canada. So they then responded to it. And their response was fascinating. Uh, Pierce... Pierce et al., that's the author of the, from Emory, the doctor from Emory, are looking for a platform to let the urology community know about their observations regarding the long-term use of Elmeron and potential ophthalmolo ophthalmological complications, so much so that they have written a letter to the editor concerning our recent article. Uh, while their letter has nothing to do with our article, we are happy that they have a chance to present their observations. They describe a toxic maculopathy characterized by symptoms of difficulty reading and prolonged dark adaptation in patients on pentosin for a median exposure of 15 years. This association is quite clearly laid out in their recent publication in Ophthalmology, <laughs> which was their article published last spring. Pentosin, which received conditional FDA approval in 1986, has been prescribed to tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of patients with IC. The optimal dose pharmacokinetics, mode of action, and even eff efficacy remain unclear, although safety was never considered an issue. Many patients with IC remain on this medication for years and even decades. It is quite unlikely that urologists treating patients with IC ever would have made this association uh, yet the implications are either frightening if our treatment is causing this condition or instructive if this condition is previously is a previously unknown manifestation of IC. And then they suggest more research. They suggest research. In fact, they suggest doing a survey uh, of IC patients, which Emory has done and which we have done. Uh, and then you realize like... <laughs> You want to talk swearing? You should have heard me for 24 hours, 48 hours over the weekend because I, I couldn't just come online and say this. Man, I needed more information. And I emailed Rob Moldwin and other people to try to figure out how to share this information with you, right? But then I went to the Journal of Ophthalmology and I paid the 30 bucks for the article that they published last, I think, May. Yeah, it was in May. And of course, urologists don't read an eye journal. We would never have seen this. Um, and what's so interesting is that they actually had several dozen patients with IC referred to their eye clinic. They specialize in rare macular disorders. And um, this is a case series. It's not a case study of one patient. It's a case series of six patients. And they share the data of these six patients. And um, what was interesting about this is they've got pictures so that you can see this. Let me show you some of the pictures. So basically, they believe that a toxic metabolite of the pentosin is being deposited on the retina. And they've got pictures. So these are different types of eye scans. So over here is an early manifestation in, in different ways. So you can see just a couple of drops here, a small area here. And then this is the same patient over time. And you can see that the damage gets bigger and bigger, you know, bigger, 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 right? And I think, this is an even better picture. So look at a small spot, bigger spot, very big, lots of spots. Same thing here, small spot, bigger spot, lots of spots. And the symptoms that patients were having were difficulty reading, difficult in low light. You know how if you, if you ever walk into a movie theater and you can't see right away? Um, it takes a little bit of time for your eyes to adapt to the darkness. Well, these patients were not adapting at all. They were really struggling. Other symptoms, straight lines would become wiggly or they would have blind spots in their eyes, uh, which we call, a, they call a scotoma. Um, 
And although their data suggested an average age of use of pent pentosin of 15 years, the, when you actually look at the patients that presented, patient number four is the youngest patient in the study. Her first symptoms began, um, I think, at the age of 24. She started Elmeron at the age of 24. And she had her first eye issues at the age of 30. Um, and in this case series, she actually, the youngest patient actually has the worst damage. So we got this and uh, again, I, e I emailed our medical board and uh, contacted Emory and uh, we developed our own survey to see if we could credibility test this, right? It's like, okay, that's what they found. We have access to thousands of patients. And so with the help of uh, Dr. Moldwin and a couple of other doctors, we created a survey on the IC network that uh, more than 700 patients have completed, which um, is nothing short of astonishing because um, there was, I think, I, I think it was a, a greater than 50% onset of eye disease in Elmeron users in our study. So then, and that survey is still ongoing. You can still take that survey on the IC network. Then I sent the data to Dr. Phil Hanno, who's the chairman of the American Urology Association IC, uh, IC committee, uh, who's very big internationally and nationally, and he's currently at Stanford. And I sent him the data and he was stunned by the data and suggested that we send it to the FDA. And we now have a citizen, citizen's petition at the FDA that was accepted and live. It took me a month to do. Um, where we are asking the FDA to take a much closer look and issue a warning uh, and perhaps a, a labeling change telling patients taking Elmeron that if they experience any eye issues at all, they should have an eye exam. Okay, and so that also is currently ongoing. So now getting back to the question that was asked here, do we have yet more substantive data from Emory? Emory, I will tell you that patient number four has been in our has been in in these lectures here. I've talked to her. She has shared her story. Many poor patients now have been referred to Emory because of our uh, support group meetings and discussing this in the articles that we're discussing. So, can we 100% sure say that this is Elmeron? It's a toxic metabolite of Elmeron? No, not yet. But it's extremely suggestive. It is a strong association at this point in time with Elmeron and eye disease. Okay. So if you are currently taking Elmeron and you have any changes in your vision, you should have an eye exam. The doctors at Emory are telling any patients of taking Elmeron with eye issues to stop the medication immediately uh, because we don't want it to progress if it is a toxic metabolite. So the question then is, well, what do you do? There are other bladder coatings. There are over-the-counter supplements that have a similar effect to Elmeron that don't come with a side effect, specifically Cysto Renew, Cysto Protec, Desert Harvest Aloe, um, and we actually we also have a new supplement that sh that should be available within a couple of weeks. Now these are not me telling you this. This this is actually what Dr. Robert Evans has been teaching in his the IC classes that he teaches at the American Urology Association for the last decade. Um, there are there are mucosal barriers that are alternatives to Elmeron. And if you go back on our Facebook page, back to May, you will see, I took a picture of the slide where he listed over-the-counter supplements as an option to Elmeron, okay? So there are other options. But again, you gotta go to your subtype here because like the, the one woman was saying here, her bladder is healthy. Her bladder is healthy. So, does she have a mucosal barrier issue? Not right now. Not right now. Has the Elmeron helped it heal? Maybe. Has the coating helped it heal? Maybe. 
Or maybe it was never that way in the first place. Maybe she's a different subtype and the Elmeron was waste. I once worked with a lady who literally put her entire life savings, which was fifty, sixty thousand dollars This was like 10 years ago, 15 years ago. She was quite elderly. She invested her entire life savings on Elmeron. And I, I asked her, I said, well, are you better? Did it ever help you? She said, no. And I said, why did you keep taking it if it wasn't helping you? And her answer was, because that's the only thing I knew, right? So you need to know there are other options. All right, let's take some more questions. Actually, let me get a drink here real quick. Let's go down to, let's go down to YouTube questions for a moment. Hendria asks, what causes burning when you haven't had anything to drink first thing, first thing in the morning? Um, if it, well, um, if it's bladder irritation, so pain is your bladder fills with urine that it's really by urination. It's just concentrated urine. You didn't drink water overnight, you know, and so your urine gets more concentrated in the morning. And so it has the potential to be more irritating in the morning or you're maybe having a muscle spasm because muscles that are working hard are muscles that build up lactic acid and lactic acid burns. So, you know, bladder wall pain is very sharp and shrill. Patients describe it as razor blades, ground glass. Pelvic floor pain is lower, it's achier, uh, it's duller. You're not as controlled by volume. You are you know, if you got a bladder wall issue, your day is completely controlled by where's the next restroom because you need that pee out of your bladder immediately. Your pelvic floor, you're not driven by that at much. So it's lower, it's achier, it's duller, but tight pelvic floor muscles have a burning quality to it. So maybe you've got some, uh, some muscle stuff going on. Hard to say. Denise says for a flare, she takes one teaspoon of baking soda and a glass of water plus one Tylenol. Um, Denise, I think that that's too much baking soda. Um, uh, I would try a half a teaspoon or a quarter teaspoon of baking soda. You don't want to be doing baking soda all day because baking soda is sodium. It could raise your blood. It could raise your blood pressure and cause other issues. Um, you know, I'm not a fan of doing alkaline water all day. I don't, I, I mean, If you're IC subtype two bladder wall driven, obviously you don't want to pour acid on a wound, right? So that helps us understand why you're not going to be drinking soda and coffee and green tea and orange juice and cranberry juice. So people kind of assume, well, maybe I need to go alkaline. If I go alkaline, that's bladder friendly. No, it's not bladder friendly at all. Bleach will eat your eyeballs out just as quickly as sulfuric acid, my friends. Bleach is alkaline. You know, I, again, I'm a chem, I've got a chemistry degree. I've got two chemistry degrees, so we're we're really funny about describing that. But that's one of the ways that when I was first working in a chem lab, you know, they really warned us about bleach, about sodium hydroxide. If you spill bleach on your fingers you know that your finger get, gets really slippery because that bleach is dissolving your skin cells. So alkalinity is not good either. We want to be neutral. We want to try to be as neutral as possible. So I do not believe you should be drinking alkaline water all day, nor do I think you should be drinking soda all day. I think you need to be drinking what your body is designed to thrive on, which is water which is a good spring water, chamomile herbal tea, peppermint herbal tea, maybe rubos tea uh, to be calming and soothing. But you really don't follow, fall down the alkalinity fad either. Don't waste your money buying alkaline water. You know, I was at a food show and I tried alkaline water for the first time. And what struck me about it is it literally it took all the mucus out of my mouth. My mouth became very dry and I'm like going, well, I sure as hell don't want to do that to my bladder at all. I want my bladder to be moist. It's supposed to be moist. Let's see. Um, Lisa asked me to ask, can you ask what people do for frequency? This is what keeps me from leaving the house. So, okay, so let me tell you where your frequency is coming from. Okay, so remember, 
this this is a three dimensional picture of your bladder, right? You got a nice coating. You got a layer of epithelial cells. Underneath that, you've got blood vessels. Those are the blood vessels and nerves. The bladder has two core nerve uh, groups. You've got the alpha afferent nerves, which control frequency urgency, and you've got the C fiber, which controls pain. The alpha afferent nerve is a nerve that is very easy to turn on because it is a nerve that tells you when you need to pee. So um, the first symptom that anybody usually experiences anytime you have any bladder issues is frequency or urgency because that is the first nerve that gets turned on when your bladder is injured. It is also the last symptom to go away. So if you think about it, as your bladder is healing and, and slowly regrowing the, any damaged cells and then generating mucus, you know, as it's slowly healing, you're still getting irritants coming down here. And, and so you're, that nerve is still going to be triggered with a little bit of frequency urgency. So the secret to controlling frequency urgency, if it's from a bladder wall issue, is to cover those wounds. You got to follow the diet, make sure that, that urine isn't getting down here and, and causing a lot of irritation. Caffeine would be very foolish for anybody with frequency because what does caffeine do? It makes you pee and it makes you poop. That's why people like their cup of coffee in the morning because it helps you have a bowel movement. But when you've got frequency urgency, it's just going to give you more frequency urgency because it's triggering these nerves. Also, following the diet uh, uh, and doing a coating that might cover, put a protective barrier here that will prevent this from, from getting irritated. But once nerves are irritated, it takes time for them to calm down. You know, when my IC started... Um, I, I, I could not have fathomed ever being pain-free. I was so used to being in pain. I mean, I was in big time pain for five years because hello, that was the dark ages and we didn't know any better. You know, I was drinking cranberry juice every day. So hello, of course I'm going to be hurting. I don't have pain every day anymore. I don't. I'm living proof that nerves heal. But I'm also living proof of IC subtype 5 central sensitization that my nerves are on a hair trigger. So I would be very foolish to start drinking a lot of caffeine, right? So um, that's, the, that's the thing. Now, I, I want to say something about the C-fiber nerve, which is your pain nerve. The C-fiber is actually a very hard nerve to turn on. It only gets turned on after some sort of significant major event, uh, some sort of injury, holding your urine too long, you know, rupturing your bladder, things like that. That's what turns the pain nerve on. But even the pain nerve can calm. Uh, the nerves calm with time. You know, I mean, your body is wired to repair itself. I can promise you right now, your body is trying to fix whatever the hell's going on with you. The human body and, and, and the animal kingdom is, is wired to fix things. It's not like you're broken and it will never heal. Things do try to heal. The bladder wall tries to heal. You get in the way of healing if you are pouring acid on a wound. It is very hard for your bladder to repair itself if you're pouring acid on it every single day. Muscles can respond beautifully to physical therapy. Healing is possible. And in fact, when Dr. Payne proposed his five subtypes of IC in his article, one of the things he said is it's so unfair to tell patients this is incurable because some types are, some subtypes are curable. Pelvic floor dysfunction is potentially curable if you are willing to do the work. Now, I'm in my editorial for our um, Fall IC Optimist, I covered something important. Hold on. All right. So our members, y'all should have gotten your IC Optimist in December. This was our a, a big expanded fall issue. And my editorial in this... Mm -hmm. 
actually it's not my editorial it is my um self-help tip one of the things that i talk about is how when you go to pelvic floor physical therapy the first time it's going to hurt you want it to hurt you want them to study your body we want to look at your muscles. We want to, and we want to look for, so they're going to externally, they're going to look at your hips. They're going to look at your abs. They're going to look at your core. They're going to look at your glutes. They're going to look at your legs. They're going to have you walk up and down the, up and down the hallway. See how you're walking. They're looking for muscle tension patterns, right? Then they're going to do an internal exam, brief, vaginal exam for a woman, rectal exam for a man. And they're going to gently touch muscle. And if they touch something and trigger your pain, Holy moly, that is a fantastic success because they found it. They found it. Don't be afraid of pain at that first appointment. If they found it, that is fantastic because now then they know what to do. They know where to work. But what happens is some patients that scares them, that pain scares them. And, and they don't ever want to go back because it hurt. Like after my hysterectomy last year, I went to physical therapy. I didn't even have internal work. I just had external work two months after my surgery. And oh my God, I drove home crying. <laughs> and I laid in my recliner for eight hours with a heating pad and I took Norco because it because I had had surgery and we pushed, you know, we pushed things with stitches. And they still had stitches in them, as a matter of fact. It was a terrible mistake for me to try to do that in the first place. Okay, but. Pain during physical therapy is at that first appointment is a tremendous success because finally nobody's looking at you. And, you, you know, it's not like you're trying to say, don't you believe me? I'm in pain. You know, and you get that blank look. Well, I don't see anything. But when they can touch it, it's like, oh, hell yeah, you're in pain. There it is. There's that muscle. For me, it was my my levator and I was spasming for 10 months after the surgery. And when the doctor finally looked and touched it, and he could feel it quivering. He's like, oh, this is after months of telling me on the, you know, by email. Oh, you're just healing from the surgery. You're just healing from the surgery. It takes time. It's like, no, you MO. It wasn't that. It was that my muscles were spasming. And so anyway, God, can I rant? I believe me, ranting is good. There are moments when we need to rant. All right, let's go back to questions. And again, if I miss it on Facebook or YouTube, please ask it again because your, your questions go back and I get, you know, I can talk forever about, about this stuff. Uh, Jennifer on YouTube says her liver enzymes skyrocketed to 1200, which is why she was forced to go off Elmeron. K is in a flare since November, so K. Uh, if you come over to the IC Network website and you sign up for our newsletter, you can get our 40-page flare management guide for free. You download it, and it will give you an hour-by-hour -hour rescue plan. In fact, I'm going to rewrite that this year. <laughs> All right, let's go back to Facebook here. Cindy, my bladder looks fine but doesn't feel fine. Okay, but Cindy, that's the entire point. So it's really probably not your bladder that's driving this. It's probably your pelvic floor or central sensitization. So if your bladder looks fine, do you need to do a bladder coating? Probably not. Instead, we need to do a little bit more investigation, try to figure out what that is. Carol, Carol Morgan asks, where do you get Valium suppositories from a compounding pharmacy? Uh, somebody asks, is it possible to have more than one subtype? Absolutely. Uh, I am, I see subtype five central sensitization. I see subtype three pelvic floor primary. It's kind of like the, the central sensitization is just the foundation. You know what? It's just my environment. It's just the way my body works. I, we don't look at that as a disease, but it does explain why I'm so sensitive. But my fundamental pelvic issue is a tight injured uh, left piriformis muscle and some that go back years. Okay. Kyle says, how do you find out what subgroup you're in? Your doctor never mentioned subtypes. He just said hydrodescension with NS. I don't know what that means. He said your bladder showed definite signs of IC. Uh, um, you know, a lot of doctors, especially local urologists, regional urologists are not using any subtyping at all. 
Uh, they don't even know about it uh, They because they don't go to the classes. Um, uh, so the information I'm giving you is very cutting edge. At, 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 it's at the upper leagues of the IC community. Both the research community and clinical care providers are the ones who are using subtyping or phenotyping. They might not call it that, but they're looking at those same variations that I said. Cindy says, what do valium, valium suppositories help? Um, they are muscle relaxants. They will relax tight pelvic floor muscles. Sarah was prescribed belladonna opium suppositories. It helped a lot. Um, yeah, you know, they, they have been a fair, you know, obviously that's a stronger opium based uh, medi pain medicine. Um, but they've certainly been used for years by some IC patients. If you ever go, if you if you are at the emergency room with any major pain condition, the odds are they might consider giving you a belladonna opium suppository. Terry says, your doctor told her that other drugs can do it, not just the Elmeron. Sure, absolutely. But the Elmeron case is growing and growing in my opinion. Um, Bumika, um, uh, if you just come to our website and go into our shop, you will find all of the supplements. The IC network, we do have a mail order center. Thank you, Granny, for writing those. Terry, you know, uh, Terry says, thank you, Jill, for all of your hard work. I guess I need to change your eye doctor because you just passed your eye exam last week and you've been on meds for seven years. You know, remember, not uh, at least in our study, it was 53%. So 53% of Elmeron users reported some sort of eye dysfunction. But that means that, you know, 47% didn't. So you might be absolutely fine with it. But getting a second opinion is not a bad idea if you indeed are having really weird eye symptoms or you're having blind spots or difficulty with low lights or squiggly lines instead of straight lines. Uh, Kayla, what do I think about the horrible side effects of Elmeron? I've never been an Elmeron fan in any way, shape or form. Um, uh, Elmeron is uh, the, the ultimate, I mean, Elmeron was created with the best of intentions. Dr. Lowell Parsons at UC San Diego created it, you know, and it was FDA approved in 1996. And prior to the approval of Elmeron, patients had to go be catheterized to get a medicine in their bladder. And a lot of patients stopped going to the doctor because they didn't want to be catheterized. And so the intention of Elmeron was honorable. The intention of Elmeron was to create a very easy way, an oral way for somebody to get a bladder therapy. Of course, um, um, if you swallowed a Band-Aid, would you expect it to come out the other end a Band-Aid? And the answer is no, of course not. Of course not. So it's, it's a drug concept called bioavailability. The bioavailability of Elmeron, is that, wait, is that the right one? I think that's the right one, um, is, is low. 93% of Elmeron is destroyed by digestion. And that is from Baker Norton's, Baker Norton was the first pharmaceutical company to develop. Their own researchers prove that, that the vast majority of Elmeron you take orally is rendered inactive by digestion. Only 7% or approximately 7% actually arrives at the bladder to do any good. So, of course, with that poor bioavailability, or actually, I think the correct term is direct. Mm, gosh, I'm just having a brain moment on that term. Um, unfortunately, with so little of it actually arriving in the bladder, you have to take a lot of Elmeron over time for it to build up. And that's when you start seeing these, these more toxic side effects. Elmeron is actually a pretty rough medication on patients. It's known for 
causing stomach distress, gut distress, explosive diarrhea, changes in liver enzyme level, easy bruising, um, um, hair loss. So while it was, of course, the only oral approved medication for years and years and years, one thing we certainly learned, and I learned as a support group leader, is that there were a ton of patients who were taking Elmeron who got nowhere with it. And now we know why, because of the subtypes. If they probably don't have a bladder wall subtype, they probably have a pelvic floor subtype. So again, we're, you know, Elmeron is not the only act in town. Of course, the biggest barrier with Elmeron right now is the cost. Uh, it went off formulary. Um, I mean, it, it went off uh, patent. And um, uh, Johnson & Johnson or Janssen Pharmaceuticals, uh, they just have been raising the price because they, they're kind of waiting for the generic to come to under, underwrite their market. Um, unfortunately, the generic is uh, probably not going to get here because the FDA is requiring that company to repeat all of the original studies. And I don't think that they're gonna do that. I haven't talked to them in a while. So from, from a cost standpoint alone, most patients cannot pay for Elmeron. I certainly couldn't pay. I think the last time I looked, it was anywhere from 1,500 to 2,500 for a three month supply. And if it's not covered by insurance, you compare and contrast that with an over the counter supplement, Cystoprotec, also created by a major IC researcher, Dr. Thea Harides at Tufts University, blood or coating effect, under $50 uh, for a month. So that's the, uh, dis, despite all the, the side effects that can happen, the biggest motivation for somebody not for walking away from Elmeron is they just can't afford it anymore. And we're just really very lucky that we have other urologists who have taken the time to try to create a formula that would be beneficial to the bladder. So Sister Protec was created uh, maybe 18 years ago, 17 years ago, by Dr. Thea Harides at Tufts University, a big federally funded IC researcher. That was a very interesting story about, he was doing some work for the state to verify the safety of supplements because he's a pharmacologist MD. And as he was doing that work for, this, for the state, um, he was looking at the data and looking at what it's doing and he goes, gee, I wonder if this would help IC. And then the more he learned about it the, more it, the more he thought it would be helpful. And he decided to create a supplement and he created first Algonaut. And then that morphed into Sister Protect two years later. And Sister Protect has been one of the top, I mean, the top supplement for years. Unfortunately, it's an older formula and we've learned a lot about IC since then. And so another doctor, Dr. Gio Espinosa, who's the director of integrative urology at New York University, he created the next generation supplement five years ago called Sisto Renew. And Sisto Renew does more than Sisto Protec. So um, it has a few more ingredients in it. And you can learn about that on our website. All right, I'm going to Facebook here. Maggie likes Desert Harvest Aloe. Yeah, you know, Desert Harvest is the only alternative company to pay the money to do a double blind placebo controlled research study to prove that their product helped IC symptoms. And um, uh, there, it was a small study, but it was favorable. It was, it was quite favorable. Uh, Kayla uses aloe vera gel with lidocaine, um, uh, and we, that's called Relevium, R-E-L-E-V-E-U-M. I don't think I, do I have it? Desert Harvest has uh, many, many products, uh, but they also do a personal gel. The lighting is weird. And then they also do a personal gel with lidocaine in it, which is really good if you've got vulvodynia, 
um, and you know, uh, or you you can even use it on your skin, stuff like that. Uh, Kayla is also using a CBD oil. And you know what? Hold on a sec. Let me show you one I found. Hold on. All right, so if, um, if a medical marijuana is not approved in your state and you still wanna try CBD oil, you can do, or cream, you can do one from hemp. And this is one I got, see, I'm sorry, the light I have to use because it's stormy, it's not very good. It's, um, a, com it's a company called Sagely CBD Cream. And it's just made, it's made from hemp CBD. You can buy this in any state. Uh, this is not illegal. And so that would be interesting to try too. Uh, Suan wants some of the normal differences uh, in the subtypes between subtype two. Um, and here, hold on a sec. Let's, let me just change this light here a little bit. Let's see. Is that better? No? Nope. Oh, well. All right. Um, so I see subtype two, bladder wall driven. You have pain as your bladder fills with urine that is relieved by urination. Um, and so it's driven by the bladder wall. I see subtype three, pelvic floor. We tend to see more pain after urination, that your worst pain is not before you pee or while you're peeing, your worst pain tends to be afterwards. But you know, it, it, it can kind of merge between the two. Pudendal neuralgia, you've got positional pain. You're fine when you stand, but when you sit, it hurts. Or when you bend over, it hurts. Or for me, when I lay flat on my back, I, get, I have a little pudendal nerve entrapment on my left side from this tight muscle. I feel it when I lay flat on my back. And central sensitization, you know, you know you got central sensitization if you've got an uber sensitive sense of smell, sensitive skin, stuff like that. Kayla says they're saying Elmeron is like chemotherapy and the effects are horrible. Hmm. Not for everyone, honey. Elmeron has helped people. I mean, you can't, we can't just say Elmeron's bad. Elmeron has helped a lot of people, just, just not everyone. And now we're seeing that there is a potential eye problem with that. See, I'm starting to squirm because my left uh, muscle is hurting. Hold on, let me, let me start. It's time to sit on it's time to sit on the yoga ball. <laughs> All right. How long have we been going right now? It's 1:30. Oh no, we've been we've been live for an hour and a half. Rose says, does the diet take care of the pain and you won't need to do anything else? You know what? For quite a few people it does. Uh, you would be amazed at the response some patients have with the diet. And that's really why when you go to a urologist for the first time and you've got symptoms of frequency, urgency, pressure, pain, uh, and your basic tests are negative, you don't have UTI, you don't have major blood in your urine, uh, and they suspect IC, the odds are what they're going to do is give you the diet and uh, tell you to, uh, give you the step one treatments, maybe some of the step two treatments, and then send you home for three months or six months. And, and a lot of patients are really surprised by that. A lot of patients are like, well, don't you want to do a test? And they're like, no, we don't need to do a test right now. Because I, I really believe that many, many patients who are struggling with IC-like symptoms, that it, it comes from just a, an overly acidified or very, very irritated or heavily caffeinated diet. And so there are a significant number of patients who do tremendously better just by changing their diet. And at least when you follow the diet, you're, you're not going to give yourself a flare by pouring acid on the wound, 
if you have Hunter's lesions or IC subtype 2. Ah, I gotta get my I gotta get my ball in the right position. <laughs> if I start bouncing, that's why. Rose says she did physical therapy for a year and it never helped. So, uh, Rose, what I would want to know is what did they find during your first examination? What muscle was the problem? What group of muscles were the problem? Was it, was it on the left side? Was it on the right side? Was it low or high? That's number one. Number two, I would want to know what did you do at home when you weren't at the physical therapist? And, and that, is, that is a failing I have to admit to. I am extremely passive aggressive when it comes to doing my pelvic floor work. I mean, I will pay lots of money because I got to pay out of pocket $110 for every physical therapy visit. And do I do everything I should do to follow up every day? No. And that's my resolution for this year. My resolution for this year is to do my physical therapy exercises five days a week. And so far, I'm doing that. So far, I'm doing that uh, because I'm just tired of being in pain from this from this left muscle thing. It's just not doing well. And I want to get better. It's not my bladder. It's my muscle. And and some people also, you know, they just want to take a pill. It's like, can I just take a pill and make this better? And it's like, no, you can't. Muscles require muscle work. You know, here's your normal pelvic floor. Here's a tight pelvic floor. And, you know, let me... Uh, where is my let me give you an example uh let me give you an example so here is you know this is my kind of example of a normal pelvic floor right and so your pelvic floor again it goes from left to right low to high front to back right so your pelvic floor's job is to keep your organs in place. If you sustain an injury, so let's say you had a baby and you got torn badly. What happens is that muscle gets injured. And then it's struggling to do its job, right? Because it's injured and it's weak. So it just starts getting tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter. Tight muscles restrict blood flow. So if you squeeze your arm and you let it go, see how wide it got? Because I was squeezing it. When you've got tightness, it restricts blood flow. So if your muscles are tight, your bladder is not getting the blood flow that it needs to be healthy. Our therapeutic goal for this, for this patient group is to restore blood flow by relaxing muscles. But here's another thing that happens. Another thing that happens after an injury is sometimes your muscles get weak. Well, every time after your injury, your muscles tend to get weak. And what happens is they start to let the organs move and fall. And we call this a prolapse. And I was working with a patient yesterday uh, who had the beginning of a prolapse. It wasn't falling out of her, but it was just starting. And I said to her, I said, well, have you gone to the physical therapist yet? And she goes, no, they didn't give me a referral. And I'm like, what? <laughs> they told you you have a you have a moderate prolapse and they haven't even sent you to physical therapy yet. And, and she said, no. And I said, girl, come on now, you got to call back and ask, we need it. You need to start working on it because when you get to the point where you're in full prolapse, you muscle work, isn't going to fix that. I mean, that's, that's muscle stretch too far and you'll have to have some surgery or use a pessary to get that back in place. Where do you have physical therapy from a, a pelvic floor physical therapist? 
on our website and in our find a doctor area, our, our current, our find a specialist database is broken because the app maker broke the mapping function. But I also have a list of national organizations that you can look at. You can look at the list at the International Pelvic Pain Society, which is pelvicpain.org to find a doctor or physical therapist, or you can go to hermanwallace.com. They're the leading pelvic floor training organization, and they have a list of all the physical therapists they've trained around the world, and you can search their database. Wendy joined from Nebraska. She says the Cisto Protec and Sister Renew are helping and that using a pro probiotic is also helping. Amber says she loves physical therapy. It works wonders. It does. I'll tell you, it, it works wonders for me. Cassie, what's the number one piece of advice I'd give to somebody newly diagnosed? Understand your subtype. Uh, I, I, Actually, I'm going to give you two pieces of advice. Please, please, please don't go into any Facebook or ICN group and start reading stories and going, oh, my God, everybody's doing terribly. That's going to happen to me and get super, super depressed. You have to remember that support groups are always biased towards patients who are struggling. So for every patient online having a bad day, there are tens of thousands having a great day. So do not assume that I see is this dark evil force that will dominate your life. Many, many patients do very, very well. So concept number one is remember that support groups are always biased towards people who are struggling. Concept number two is we no longer think of IC as an incurable bladder disease. We don't. And I, we just spent the first part of this meeting talking about the subtypes. We consider IC a pelvic pain syndrome. Uh, why do we cause, why do we say that? Because in many, if not most patients, structures outside of the bladder are also involved, specifically the pelvic floor muscles. So if anybody's giving you that this is incurable, there's no hope, that's bullshit. Uh, we now have great success in working with different populations of patients. We have patients who are who go symptom free for years, if not decades or longer. You know, sometimes people, you know, again, as I say, the human body is wired to heal. So if you hurt your bladder, let's just say you hurt your bladder because you went on a bender with diet soda for, for a month. And at the end of that, your bladder's screaming. Okay, and then you stop the diet soda. Is your bladder permanently damaged? No, it's not permanently damaged. Your bladder is going to try to fix that damage. And your bladder is capable of healing if you create the environment that will help it to heal. So for that patient, they may have symptoms for three to six months, maybe even longer, but eventually things calm down as the bladder heals. And then they're fine for years and years and years until something else happens and they hurt their bladder again, or they go through chemotherapy, or they hit menopause and um, you know their bladder coating's a little bit thinner. So that's concept number two. Um, and then concept number three is uh, come over to our website and watch our subtyping video so that you understand these distinct patient populations. I don't want you to spend five years on Elmeron if your bladder's healthy. And a lot of people's bladders are completely normal. It's not their bladder that's a problem. It's their pelvic floor or a nerve or something else. In contrast, it would be a tremendous shame for you to... Uh, struggle with terrible pain and not get relief because nobody's looked in your bladder. You know, um, I don't like people guessing about me. If I'm in pain, I wanna know why I'm in pain. I want eyeballs on the organ. And so if something is clearly not right, I want a doctor to, to look at it. And so having a cystoscopy, I've had two plain cystoscopies, I call them looky-loos, five minute procedures in the office, they numb your urethra, stick a cystoscope in, look around, pull it out, bam, well, you're done. That will look for bladder stones that might see anything big. And if you find that over time, you're not responding to diet, that you're not getting better, then what the AUA guidelines say is take a step back and let's revisit the diagnosis. If this patient is not improving, if this patient is getting worse, we need to take a step back, 
look at that diagnosis again and see if we've missed anything like Hunter's lesions. You'd be stunned at the number of patients who call here who are in terrible pain and either they've never had a hydrodistension or they did have a hydrodistension. The doctor did find Hunter's lesions, but they never treated them. It's like, are you kidding me? You're in there looking at the lesion and you don't treat it? You're condemning that patient to suffer with severe pain from an open wound in their bladder. That's why if you're ever scheduled to have a hydrodistension, you need to have a discussion with your doctor beforehand and say, all right, I'm ready to have it. I want you to do a low pressure short duration like the AUA suggests. I want you to minimize trauma to my bladder. I'm not interested in any high pressure procedures. We've talked about that before in these meetings. But even more so, you have to have a discussion about, okay, what do you plan on doing if you find anything? If you find a, if you find a hunter's lesion, will you be treating it? And if they say no, you're going to say, why not? Because you're in there. I don't want to have this done again. If it's in there and you see it, can you please treat it for me? And they would either uh, cauterize it or inject it with a steroid. But it'd be real a real shame for you to be diagnosed with lesions and you wake up in the OR and they say, yeah, you've got lesions and they don't treat it because lesions don't respond to Elmeron. And that's really condemning you to pain you know, for months, if not years, until they're treated correctly. Um, I'll tell you a funny story. You want to hear a real funny story? Um, uh, the, uh, the American Urology Association annual meeting is where 40, 50,000 urologists around the world gather and they go, they get trained in all sorts of things and they network and they present their research in a it's like a science fair. If you've ever gone to a student science fair, you know you walk around and there are posters on the wall and the student stands in front of the poster and answers your question or they might have a little display. Well, at the annual urology meetings, that's exactly what they do. They all the, Any new research that's accepted is printed on a big poster, it's put on the wall and the researcher stands in front of it. So there was a uh, researcher from Europe who um, uh, presented a paper in which he suggested that the only correct treatment for, for a hunter's lesion was a Botox injection. And his data was mediocre, right? And they gave him uh, what we call a podium session where he was allowed to speak to the entire group of IC researchers. Very intimidating process. This was a teaching moment. They accepted him not because he had a good idea. They accepted him because they were trying to instruct him. And so he gets up in front of this audience of 100 or 200 IC researchers and gives his theory on why Botox should be the only treatment for lesions, despite the fact that patients didn't feel better afterwards. And the number one doctor in Europe, Dr. Nordling, was the first up at the microphone and just started hammering him with questions. And just like, you know, you know, what is your, you know, what did you see? A, B, C, D. And his, again, his data was really poor. And, and, and finally, Dr. Nordling said, you know, have you ever cauterized a lesion? Have you ever injected with a steroid? And, and this, this young guy goes, no, never. We only treat lesions with Botox. And he said, well, maybe you need to start treating them correctly because in my patient group, I can get, I can get 90% of these patients out of pain if I treat the lesion. You are condemning your patients to live with pain because you're not willing to do the right therapy. So, the, you know, those meetings are pretty cutthroat. Terry says, is Elmer on an autoimmune suppressant? No. I don't believe it is. It's a coding. Maybe there's a mechanism of action. I don't know. Uh, I should say that one of the things that was so so interesting about the Emory Eye Center research is they actually found a very early clinical trial with Elmeron, a patients who took it up to four years, in which there were other documented eye problems, uh, like retinal hemorrhaging. Um, so. Um, it's not like other eye issues hadn't ever been reported, although I had never seen that study and I had never, we've never ever up until 2018 had any discussion 
uh, Elmeron changing eyesight or causing major eye issues, but those researchers actually did find an early study that was part of the FDA approval uh, that did find other eye issues with Elmeron. Kayla says, have you ever just discussed how big hormones play a role in IC? Absolutely. Low estrogen, low estrogen does not cause UTI. Low estrogen reduces the production of mucus, which makes the bladder wall more vulnerable to UTI. And, and in that IC subtype 2 bladder wall, there is a very clear sub subtype that's hormonally driven. And we call it the genital urinary syndrome of menopause. And it would surprise me if there were another hormonal variant in there as well that would also involve younger patients. Kathy, where can I find a doctor who can do cutting ed the cutting edge exam in Central California uh, up in San Jose at Vista Urology? Dr. Christopher Payne uh, practices. He left his practice at Stanford and he now is in private practice. They're the top pelvic pain center on the West Coast. Um, and he's the guy who developed the subtyping system that I've just uh, gone through. And so you can see him, vistaurology.com. Bumika, will anyone from India be able to log into our website? Uh, yes, um, Bumika, um, we had to block um, uh, India because we had many, many hacking attempts coming from India. However, uh, early this week, um, we are completely uh, moving the IC network to a new server and changing firewalls. And I will be able to let people from India come back in as long as we don't get massive hackers. Um, it's, I, I, that's what I was doing till three in the morning last night is I was actually doing what I've dreaded doing for the last 15 years, which is going through every single freaking file on my server for the IC network, throwing stuff out, moving stuff over. And so Bumika, yes, you should be able to uh, get on soon. Uh, if you could email me, uh, IC network at map.com. Um, and let's try to finesse that a little bit because I want to make sure you get access, okay? Jennifer, what's a delicious looking drink? I was drinking, which is the same one right here. It is a, a pumpkin spice rubos tea that we sell on the IC Network store. It's by Harney and Sons. Love it, love it, love it. This is the same one. It's the, pretty much the only tea I drink. Agata. Oh, I love your name. I love that name, Agata. What a great name. How does diet affect people with IC subtype five central sensitization? When I started having symptoms as a toddler, I feel like I have subtype five, but when I eat things outside the IC diet, my symptoms get a lot worse when I'm flaring. You know, I will tell you, Agata, that when I would, I started having food issues when I was in maybe junior high. I'm not quite as young as you, but when I was in junior high and they escalated over time until finally when um, I graduated from college um, and was in my first federal job, I remember um, uh, on my break, going down to the little cafe and getting a hot chocolate chip cookie and a glass of milk. And I ended up in the floor, on the floor in the restroom in the fetal position for three hours with bowel spasms. And that was the start of what we call adult onset food sensitivities. Um, but you can have food sensitivities as a child also. When, and a sensitivity is not an allergy. A sensitivity is more of an intolerance. It's more of your body not knowing how to process certain foods. And again, when we go back 5,000 years ago in your ancestry, that kind of makes sense, right? I mean, I come from the Arctic Circle of Norway and Sweden. I cannot eat chocolate. If I eat chocolate, I get bend over and screamer bowel spasms as I did that the first time that day. Um, chocolate comes from Africa. So we can argue that my body has not developed a defense mechanism for chocolate. Uh, I, do, I do not do well with hot and spicy foods. So uh, hot chilies, if you are of Latin American descent, 
you have been exposed to hot chilies and peppers for many, many, many generations. Your body has adapted to that and knows how to deal with that. My body was only exposed to hot chilies maybe in the last 500 to 800 years ago, maybe a thousand years ago. So does my body have a defense for hotness? I don't think so. I don't, my body doesn't do well with heat. So there may be some genetic things or maybe some regional things. You may be trying to eat some things that your body just doesn't know how to tolerate. Um, and that's separate and distinct from the IC. I mean, that's, that's really separate and distinct. I didn't really have bladder pain until I was 30. I had the food intolerances a decade or more before that. Uh, you can order, if you're in the United States, you can order food sensitivity, to, uh, uh, sensitivity testing. It's a blood test. Um, and uh, the name of the company is Alcat, A-L-C-A-T. That would be interesting. It might be interesting to go have a food sensitivity test to see if you can find those foods that your body just does not like. I had one lady whose mother had IC and she tried the diet and it didn't work. And um, then they did the food sensitivity testing. And when they did the food sensitivity testing and her mom eliminated those foods, she got a lot better. And then she called me back and yelled at me and said, you should have told us that the IC diet doesn't work for everyone. And it's like, but that's separate and distinct. If you have a bladder injury, the IC diet makes sense, but you're dealing with something else, which is food sensitivity. So I would look at food sensitivity testing to see if that would give you some help. Lisa, are we still down on YouTube? Because it looks like it's working for me. Roxanne, do you know anything about abdominal myofascial syndrome, pelvic floor dysfunction? I mean, fascia are just part of the structures that can be dysfunctional. And if you've got tight fascia, they're going to restrict blood flow. Now, I know YouTube's working because uh, somebody else just, Jennifer, just answered on YouTube. Kayla uses uh, aloe vera gel with lidocaine and rubs it everywhere you itch and burn. Um, yeah, you know, and that's the funny thing about central sensitization is we have really, really sensitive skin. And sometimes I get like a needle-like sensation just out of the blue. It's like somebody stabbed me with a needle here. Actually, it's, it's right there is where I get it the most. It's right on the back of my shoulder there. Um, and so having a lotion or a cream is really helpful. Eveline, where can you buy Sister Renew in Canada? Uh, it's not available in Canada. You have to order from the U.S. We ship it to Canada all the time, but you will have to pay your customs fees. Uh, Bumika, um, if you can just wait, if you can wait a, a week, um, uh, uh, because we're moving everything now, and I will be able to activate India after I get it off of our server. We're getting rid of our server. And I'm going instead to um, uh, a very specific WordPress server that is going to have much better security. I'm just tired of it. You know, any business owner who thinks they can stay on top of security trends is fooling themselves. It, the Internet is so scary right now with all these hackers. If you could look at my server logs, it's like every second of every day somebody's trying to break in. And even though they aren't breaking in, I'm tired of it. I, I, I cannot be an expert at that. I'm paying a massive amount of money. I mean, like $1,000 a month just for security. And I just realized that if I go over to a, another server, it's all built in and I don't have to pay the extra thousand bucks a month for that. So that's what we will be doing uh, probably Monday, tomorrow or Tuesday. Almost all the work's done. Where did I put the CBD cream? Uh, not internally, I would put it externally on your hip, over, over your pubes, on your lower belly. Granny Mac, do we have to worry about pesticides and poisons and CBD oils or is that removed in processing? You better damn well believe you better worry about that. Um, it's very, very important when you buy any CBD product that you look at lab testing results if it's medical marijuana based, not hemp based, medical marijuana. Um, I told the story on Thursday when I did a drop-in meeting, there was a, a gentleman down in Southern California who was using medical marijuana for a very serious pain condition. 
And I think he had started a new brand um, and he got massively worse and he felt like he was, he was being poisoned. And when he, he decided to have it tested and what he found was massive contaminants, there was rat poison and pesticides in this quote unquote organic medical marijuana that he was buying. He took it to a TV station. They did their own testing, went to a bunch of CBD dispensaries, tested a bunch of brands, and it was across the brands, massive, massive pesticide contamination and rat poison contamination. You really want to buy CBD from a company that grows their own product internally. You don't want to buy from a company that's buying off the market, you know, from who knows who. I mean, I live here in California and we have a lot of forests around here where there's, in fact, right, at, right on the hill in front of me, I remember as a kid getting worn off by a, uh, by somebody growing marijuana who's, who, you know, shot into the air a couple of times to warn the kids away. Um, we have, uh, they continue to find these illegal grows that are done by uh, gang members, usually from South America. And the entire field is contaminated with rat poison, all the owls, all the foxes, everything there, they're all dying from this terrible chemical use from these illegal grows. And trying to restore that environment is terrible. And you have to think, where is that marijuana going? It's either going on the street, and it's probably it's it's going on the street. But people are also bundling it for sale to, for use with CBD oil. So you really got to be careful and ask for testing. Go to their website, call the company, ask how they monitor it. Your health is important. You know, hopefully that's one of the reasons why it's good that medical marijuana has been approved because now they can bring in this testing. But it's, uh, you know, it's dire what's happened in the forest here on these medical marijuana grows. I mean, mar marijuana grows. It's just a tragedy of, of tragedies, what it's done to the animals because of all that stupid rat poison. Tanya, just had an MRI. You have a mild L4, L5 bulge. Do you think this could be causing your horrible pain? It could, certainly. Yeah. That could be part of it. We know that L4, L5 is where the nerves uh, affecting the pelvis and the bladder uh, converge. And so uh, their patients, if patients get a, um, what's the name of it? Uh, there's a type of cyst that can come out. Uh, the name's escaping me right now. That's well known to trigger ICA-like symptoms. And so um, possibly, possibly. If, hey, listen, if none of your other treatments are working, if diet isn't working, if install, installations didn't work in and you're getting worse, I would really go back to that orthopedic uh, perspective and try to get a handle on what's happening with your back and with that bulge and can anything be done about that and talking with your orthopedic surgeon about how that could be influencing your bladder. Lindsay asked, have you heard about intranasal oxytocin for IC pain? No. I mean, vaguely, I don't, I don't have anything to con con contribute on that topic. Pamela, how long does it take for desert harvest aloe when baking soda capsules working? Well, number one, I don't agree with baking soda capsules. I don't think you should do that because um, I don't believe in over alkalinizing the bladder and the urine. However, for any supplement, you know, you're looking at uh, six weeks minimum. Uh, you have to remember that the bladder is the slowest healing organ in the human body. Uh, it takes two weeks for just one of these cells to be replaced. And so nothing happens overnight. You have to be time, you have to be patient and kind and give your body an opportunity to heal. These are the largest single cells in the human body. It is physiologically impossible for anything to happen overnight with respect to healing. Two weeks minimum for one cell. And depending upon your degree of damage, it could be much, much longer. So you really have to stick it out. I, you know, I don't like people, when you think of IC as a chronic disease, you, you, you make your decisions based upon the fact that you're not going to let this chronic disease take away something that you love, like coffee. So it's really easy to justify drinking coffee because you're not going to let this, quote, disease rob you. However, if you look at it a different way and go, oh, I have an injury in my bladder. My bladder's wounded. Does it make any sense to pour coffee on a wound? 
The answer is no, <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't. So that's why I always tell patients, think of yourself as injured. Don't think of this as an as a incurable disease, number one, because it's not. But number two, the focusing on the concept of injury and healing and repairing that injury, whether it's to your bladder wall or to your muscles, is valid and reasonable. Rochelle, yes, man, I had a cold too. Okay, now I got to change again. Hold on. Ugh. I should stand up, but um, I don't think I can. I think I, I unplugged my sit stand desk, so I can't raise my desk up right now. Uh, so um, let me throw out one other thing here. Um, so we did a survey last month about icy friendly cold and flu strategies. And uh, let me give you some tips here based upon what other IC patients are saying about what works for them when it comes to cold and flu. Um, and uh, so let me just get this right here and look at these results. If you look on our Facebook page and, and go down a couple, you will see a link to the cold and flu survey. It would be great if you could take it and share what your IC friendly strategies are for cold. So I'm creating a master list. I like to do this every every several years. So favorite sore throat over the pro over the counter product that did not irritate your bladder or trigger an icy flare was honey lozenges or Ricola lozenges. Uh, honey was number one, Ricola number two, uh, Ludens number three, chloroseptic number four. Favorite over the counter cough products that did not trigger icy flares, Hall's cough drops and Ricola drops. Uh, and Robitussin came in third, Delsim cough relief came in fourth. I'll be publishing this on our website probably late next week. What flavor uh, drops or lozenges work best for you that don't irritate your bladder? Number one, honey. Number two, cherry. Number three, menthol. Uh, what are your favorite over-the-counter products for congestion? Uh, number one, Mucinex. Number two, Vicks VapoRub. Number three, Sudafed. Just remember, quite a few people, myself included, cannot take Sudafed because it can give us an irregular heart rate. Uh, hot chamomile with tea with honey, peppermint tea, Mucinex, uh, honey and hot water. Those were what patients turned to to try to soothe their throat when they were coughing. What is your icy, favorite icy friendly beverage to drink when you've got a cold or flu? Chamomile herbal tea, peppermint herbal tea, pe hot pear juice, hot apple juice, rubos. Uh, aromatherapy, you got mixed reviews, uh, over-the-counter pain relievers, Tylenol was number one, Advil was number two, aspirin was number three. There you go. I'll publish that uh, on the IC network on hopefully later this week if I if all the server transitions work well and I don't ever have to do that again. Please God. Donna says she's in horrible uh, pelvic pain. Doctor said it's microinflammation. Didn't look a bit, didn't look as bad. She thought, uh, as she thought, you're excruciating pain with menstrual cramps all the time. She says it's never IC. You have bad pain with IC until four months ago. You cannot sit long. Always cramps. Hun, girl, you got to have a pelvic floor assessment. We need to know what's going on with your pelvic floor. And if you want to call me this week, I would be able, I would be happy to talk with you over the phone and, and see if we can brainstorm, put, a, put a, 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 treat, a plan of action ahead for you about how to work with your doctor and maybe some things to consider. Angela says, you had a hysterectomy. How do I help this if you can't take over the counter estrogen? Well, um, uh, topical estrogen carries much less risk than oral estrogen. And so I, for example, had early uterine cancer 
um, that they think was triggered by um, the use of oral estrogen. I'd only used it for four months and my mother still takes it. Nobody in my family has any history of any estrogen driven cancers. Leave it to me <laughs> to be the first, right? Um, and so, um, but I still use my, a little bit of topical estrogen at the entrance to my urethra and in my vagina and, and the risk is much, much less. So, you know, um, I would Google safety topical estrogen products and read that and see what that has to say. Some doctors are willing to go there. Some aren't. Um, but more and more, especially in the last year, we just had more data supporting that topical estrogen stayed in the area and didn't appear to create any substantial link, uh, risk of other cancers like breast cancer. I actually have a, a, a doctor's appointment on Tuesday with my gynecologist to talk about this again, because another doctor wants me to go back on topical estrogen on and I'm like, uh, hell no. Are you kidding? I just lost 16 months with a terrible surgery rec recovery from uterine cancer. I don't want to go through that with breast cancer. And we're going to talk about the risks of that. Donna, if you're having contractions all day, um, then uh, we need to know, are they bladder spasms or pelvic floor spasms? If they're bladder spasms, they can give you an antispasmodic like ditropan, oxybutynin. If they're pelvic floor spasms, they should be giving you a, let's say bladder wall is smooth muscle. So a bladder spasm is treated with a smooth muscle relaxant, ditropan, oxybutynin. Pelvic floor is striated muscle. So you have to use a striated skeletal, skeletal muscle relaxant. And in that case, it's going to be Flexeril, Baclofen, or Valium. So ask your doctor if you're having spasms for a, a muscle relaxant, and that should help. With my pelvic floor spasms after my surgery, I took Flexeril every night for almost 10 months, but I only took a quarter of one pill. Um, and it was essential. The spasms were violent. It was hard. Hello, Bobby from Douglasville, Georgia. Can pelvic pain be from GI things? I don't know what is doing this. Yes, I've never had bladder pain until four months ago. I'm in excruciating pain. Donna, would you please call me? Um, I, hun, I, I mean, you're in crisis right now and I would really love to help you and see if we can walk you through this. And let me give you my phone number. Where is it? What did I do with my slide? Oh, here we go. Uh, the IC Network phone number is 1-800-928-7496. And you know, I mean, listen, this is what I say to patients. You are a biological mystery to be solved. You you need a detective. I think the worst thing you can do is walk into any doctor's office and say, I have IC, help me. Instead, what I want you to do is I want you to walk into the doctor's office and say, I am having muscle spasms for hours at a time. Can you please help me understand why I'm having these muscle spasms and how we can get them to stop? If you, if you bring up IC right away, you kind of fall down the rabbit hole. We don't want you to do that, you know, and that where you get into bias and all sorts of stuff like that. If you focus instead on your, on trying to understand your physiology, you're going to the doctor to try to understand what is spasming? Where is it spasming? What is spasming? Why would it be spasming? And what can they do about it? And I think you should call your doctor tomorrow and get in there and have a pelvic floor assessment or ask for a referral to a physical therapist to, so that we can figure out what the health of your pelvic floor is. And that should have been done at your first appointment. They should have checked to see if your muscles are tight. There's a reason why you're spasming, but we have to figure out what's spasming. 
and then give you a therapy that will, it will be effective at reducing that spasm. So if it's a bladder wall spasm, ditropan. If it's a pelvic floor spasm, baclofen, flexoril, or valium. And they're not pain meds. And it's reasonable. I would also be taking a, more, a hot bath twice a day. Get some heat in there. Use some heating pads. See if that will help too, okay? Tarlov cyst, yes, Tarlov cyst is the name of the cyst that gr can grow out of the spinal cord. If it's down by L4, L5, can also mimic pelvic pain and, and cause symptoms that we associate with IC. Debbie, you're going to a urologist on Thursday. Um, so again, if it's a plain office cysto, it's quick. It's a quick five-minute test. It's an in and out. I call it a looky-loo. They numb your bladder, stick a, your, stick a scope in, take a look around, pull it out, you're done. The, the legacy of that is your urethra is going to be painful afterwards. First couple of times you pee are not going to be fun. Uh, but that goes away fairly quickly. I always believe in drinking a big glass of water uh, after you're done so that when it's time for you to pee, you just bite your lip and you pee, just pee it out. Trying to dribble it out is hard because then you kind of prolong the pain. Sometimes you just got to bite your lip and do it. If they want to do a hydro distension with cystoscopy, right, there you go. You, you want to, we want to ask about technique, low pressure, short duration, and what will they do? Uh, Carol, you said your doctor prescribed topical estrogens, but your naturopath recommends topical estrogens plus progesterone. Who is right? I don't know, hun. Um, all I know is that estrogens help produce mucus. I don't believe that progesterone is involved in that bi uh, biological process. Okay, Donna, so you did have a pelvic floor assessment, lots of restrictions around bladder, abdominal soft tissue, uterus, you're in horrible pain, you have pudendal neuralgia too. Donna, I'd be very interested to know what happened four months ago when this all began. Did you fall? Something happened four months ago that triggered all this for you. I'd be very interested to know what that was. Uh, Ursula, the name of the food sensitivity test is ALCAT. A-L-C-A-T. Al. -C -A -T, Al cat like Alan, just Al, and then a cat, alcat.com is one of the food sensitivity tests. Uh, Lisa, do I believe that IC is a systemic condition? It is an IC subtype five, but not in one, two, three, and four. Hey, Donna, um, um, hold on a sec, hon, hold on. Um, I'm just going to my personal Facebook page and I'm gonna send you a friend request. I don't know if we're friends yet. Um, hold on a sec. I actually wanna to talk to you today. Um, so hold on, I wanna, I wanna send you my phone number. Oh, there's a lot of Donna Chippendales. Uh, can you send me a friend request, Donna? Uh, my my name is Jill Heidi Osborne on Facebook. Hun, can you please send me a friend request? And um, uh, I would be happy to talk to you tonight, hun. I mean, you're suffering. I want to try to help. 
Laura, can a bladder infection cause damage to the pudendal nerve? No, not directly, but indirectly. Um, when you have a bladder infection, because your bladder's in pain, your muscles are going to get tight, and it's those tight muscles that are going to squeeze the pudendal nerve. Um, of course, viruses can live on nerves. So that's the other thing. Oh, you know what, Donna? No, I do see you. Okay, I'm adding you as a friend. I've sent you a friend request on Facebook. Would you accept that friend request, hon? Ursula says, is a urologist only for men? Absolutely not. There are many female urologists who work with, who specialize in female urology. Um, uh, so uh, urologist is, is usually where an IC patient will go. Of course, you have to remember that doctors are trained based upon their specialty. And so their world is influenced by their training. So if you go to a primary care with symptoms of frequency urgency, the primary care is gonna think, uh, you have UTI, or if you're a man, the primary care is going to think you have prostatitis. If a woman goes to a, a, a gynecologist for frequency urgency, the gynecologist is going to look at the reproductive tract. If you go to a urologist, urologist is going to look at the bladder. And for men, what happens is they sometimes get labeled with chronic prostatitis when they actually might have other things going on. Um, So, uh, but you, uh, women can go to a urogynecologist, and in fact, some men go to urogynecologists who spe specialize in pelvic pain. Urogynecologists sometimes have a side practice of men with pelvic pain. Hello, Brenda. Nice to see you. All right. Jennifer, were the wildfires bad in your area this year? They were terrible. Terrible. It's very scary right now. Guys, seriously, if you're thinking about moving to California, don't. Or move to the desert where nothing can burn. <laughs> but if you live in the hills like I do, it's a it's a really scary time right now with climate change and and all that sort of stuff. Uh, uh, you know, I used to, I live on a beautiful hillside. I can look at a, a beautiful hill right outside my window. It's the only hill that didn't burn last year when 5,000 homes burned. And so we are now living on pins and needles from May through December. You know, it's like because the fires are spreading so quickly. It's so rapidly. They're just unstoppable right now. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, listen, um, so uh, aside from Donna, who I hope has accepted my friend request, um, we've been going for about two hours and 20 minutes. And so uh, this is your last call for questions. I always end these meetings with the same thing. Um, I want you to, if there's one thing you remember from this conversation today is that this is not your fault. You have done everything absolutely nothing wrong. There is no shame. There is no blame. I don't want you carrying any weight on your shoulder like I did, thinking that you're damaged goods or you're not worth it. You know, having IC is no different than being in a car accident. And for many patients, it begins with a car accident. You are hurt. And yet we are so good at minimizing ourselves. We are so good, you know, especially at men and women alike. You know, we culture, society kind of teaches us that we're supposed to hide how we're feeling. Men especially are told to be a man, to buck up, to not talk about it. And what that leads to is a lot of shame and blame. And I don't want you to carry any shame and blame. I don't want you to hide this from everybody, anybody. You know, we just got through the holidays. Holidays are hard because odds are some of you dealt with family members who looked their nose down at you and was like, oh, come on, that's not any better. Oh, come on, drink cranberry juice. You know, all that sort of crap that you just simply don't need to hear. Um, you are a mystery to be solved. And it is your job on a daily basis to create an environment that will support your healing physically, mentally, and emotionally. Um, if you are a pelvic floor patient like I am, would you please do your work every day 
don't be passive aggressive like I can be. You got to, guys, come on. Every day I need you. 15 minutes, do something for your spirit. Do something that will lift your soul and your spirit. I don't care what it is. You can take a walk. You can go to Redwood. You can go to you can, a Redwood tree. You can go to church. You can listen to Joel Austin. Just do something that nourishes you spiritually and your soul. I need you to do commit to something every day for your body and for your health, whether it's following the IC diet, doing your physical therapy, calling the doctor if you need help. Um, you know, we kind of think that we get overwhelmed because we think there's like a big giant thing we should do and it'll all go away. And it doesn't work like that. It's little steps. You're taking little steps every day to get to healing. And it's the little steps that are far more important than the big steps. So following the IC diet, doing our little anxiety thing that I shared earlier, drinking plenty of water, working on your stress, working on relaxation, building your knowledge of IC. That's a third thing I need you to do every day is seriously read one blog a day. And don't, don't go to a website that says cure your IC you know, by following this diet, would you seriously come to our website and like read a journal article? <laughs> come on, you got to up your game with your knowledge level here, here. Nobody could ever tell me to my face, I see it's all in my head. I will shred them alive with research. And I want you to be able to do the same thing. Knowledge is power, my friends. Knowledge is power. So no shame or no blame here. You have never worked as hard as you are working at this very moment because you are truly one day older and one day wiser. OK, so so keep it up. Look at yourself at the end of the day with pride. You've made it through another day. Don't look down at yourself. Look up at yourself. Please open the drapes. Let the sun shine in. Open your front door. Would you walk out? Take a little walk, even if it's to the end of your walkway and back. Try to get every out every day and uh, uh, fill your don't suffer in silence at home alone. Call your friends, invite them to your house, talk on the phone, come online, come play Fortnite with me. Does anybody play Fortnite? Oh my God, I love Fortnite right now. It is so fun. If anybody wants to play Fortnite, send me a message on Facebook and I'll, I'll give you my username. We got to hook up. Come on, we can have a squad of IC patients in Fortnite. It's hysterical. I've never laughed so hard as I have with Fortnite. And the really cool thing about it are the kids playing with the kids. I played with a 77 year old and I played with a five year old and it's just hysterical and it's just joy in a way. I mean, I know some people don't like the concept of a, of a shooting game. It's, it, it, you just have to try it. It's, it's fun. I also play World of Warcraft every now and then too. Alrighty. All right, everybody be well. I wish you well, have a wonderful day. I mean, have a wonderful week ahead. You'll see me again in two weeks, two weeks from today on Sunday, I will be doing drop in meetings as well. And uh, so make sure you like our Facebook page, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please share a Facebook page with all of our friends. Please share this meeting in your IC groups. If nobody is doing this online. My goal is to really give you the best information I have on IC. And I think I'm doing a pretty good job. At least I'm trying. If you ever think I'm not doing a good job, please tell me. If there's anything you think I get wrong, please tell me. The people I appreciate the most in my life, especially in the IC community, are people who give me good feedback. If I'm doing something wrong, I want to fix it. I'm not afraid of criticism. OK, let me know what I can do better, too. OK. All right, my friends. Be well. Donna. Donna, I'm going to message you right now. Okay. All right, everybody. Be well. I'm going to say goodbye to YouTube first. Goodbye, YouTube.